Hello and welcome to the Boston Herald podcast. <laughs> my name is Harold Lapidus. My special guest today is Renaissance man Jeff Slate. Um, he's returned to the podcast. Uh, we, last time we uh, spoke, uh, it was uh, back in 2020. I was surprised it was that far, that long ago. Wow. Um, yeah. And wow. Uh, back in lockdown days. And um, uh, he's, uh, he's a busy guy. Uh, not only is he a journalist and has uh, spoken to, uh, interviewed most of the, the big names that you know, um, but he's a musician in his own right. He's uh, he's uh, been busy also writing liner notes. Uh, some of these albums you might have heard of, like Blood on the Track, Sgt. Pepper, Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, he helped with a, a Roy Orbison biography. Um, and uh, we'll uh, be talking about some of that soon. And, he, and the reason I invited him onto the show is he has a new single and an album. The single came out on uh, Valentine's Day. It's called Broken Without You for all the people who, I guess, didn't have a Valentine. <laughs> that was the label's choice, not mine, but I thought it was clever nonetheless. <laughs> um, and the album uh, is coming out uh, May 17th. It's called The Last Day of Summer. Uh, so it's coming out in the spring. And um, and uh, uh, actually, I should have asked you before. Do you have, uh, the, the, there'll be, of course, a blog that goes along with this. But the, you, I just saw that when you sent me the... Uh, information there's a, an excellent picture and before i even knew it was bob gruen who took the picture there's a great picture of you for the cover of uh the single right that's for the single or for the album uh i don't know what picture there's well bob gruen did all the photos you're, you're like so. this or you have like you know, your hands in front of your face oh yeah 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 that's the album cover right yeah right, right. That's great, great yeah cover. i mean i i you know during the pandemic nobody had anything to do so we went outside and shot, shot some photos bob bob i've known bob since you know the punk days so he was very gracious to say yes and they're amazing photos because he's bob groom right for those who don't know you know uh, you know john lennon legendary pictures um bob dylan against his wishes he took some pictures at the rolling thunder review i believe and just a lot a lot of great a lot of a lot of punk era pictures too just a legend so it's a it's great to have that as a cover um and you um and the single that uh we're going to uh talk about in a bit um was produced or or helped produced by uh um david uh, david <laughs> dave stewart <laughs> getting my uh my uh One of the my rock legends uh mixed up there uh uh most people know him from the rhythmics obviously but um he's worked with tom petty bob dylan daryl hall Mick Jagger, brian ferry ringo stevie nicks joss stone and now jeff slate um <laughs> And the, um, so I and got some great musicians on the on the album too, which we'll get to. Um, oh, and also uh, Dave Stewart though, did those Bob Dylan videos in the mid eighties. He did, yes. So, um, uh, but before we get to um, your music, I want to cover a few other things. Um, uh, I the uh, you got the interview of a lifetime, Bob Dylan. I'm not sure how much you can uh, talk, share about that, but um, it's you know. Congratulations! That was awesome. You must must have, your mind must have been blown when you got that. So, what what can what can you say about that? I'm, I know there's a lot of, uh, um, you know. Yeah, my my it's, my, it's, my it's Bob Dylan. <laughs> my NDA has an NDA. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, you know, it it was in the works for a while. Um, <clears throat> so I um, let's see, what can I say? So. You know, the philosophy of modern song had come out. This is the fall of, of 22. And um, I had a call with his office about something unrelated. And, you know, look, every time Bob has something out and he has something in the news, it would be ridiculous of me not to ask if I could interview him. Um, and, you know, we have a relationship. I've worked on some the mini doc uh, about the 66 tour and I did the more blood more tracks liner notes and so you know it's a long-standing relationship um so I sort of offhandedly offered the 20 odd questions section of the Wall Street Journal which is gear and gadgets it's in the Sunday gear and gadgets section and I had I had posed this previously because it's just so weird that I thought you know, Bob might kind of like it. And, you know, the response to that question is always no. But apparently, you know, you always, when you put out something, the the 
in this case, the Simon issues through the publishing house wanted him to do something. And the response wasn't no. It was, oh, well, that's not a bad idea. Let's ask Bob, which I was shocked. <laughs> and, you know, within like 24 hours, the answer was yes, which was crazy. Now, at the time, he was on the road in England. I mean, I guess at the time he was on the road in, in, in France. And and so we we figured that we would, um, you know, it was really hard with the time difference and also him being Bob Dylan, trying to corral him. Um, and the Wall Street Journal was insistent on shooting a portrait because part of the, part of the 20 odd questions um, thing is that they shoot an original portrait for the Wall Street Journal. So like Bob didn't want to do that because he was on the road. And, and I understood that. And the editors at the journal were a little like, well, that's part of what he has to do. And I'm like, okay, well, we can either have Bob Dylan or you can, or <laughs> with no photo and we can work around that. <laughs> so, so that was going on. Meanwhile, um, you know, they wanted to know what I was going to ask about because he obviously does want to ask, be asked about writing the Times Era Change in or, you know, whatever it is. Mm. And it was, he liked the questions. Like right off the bat, I, you know, I just sort of fired off maybe 25 or 30 questions that I thought, you know, would be in the ballpark. And, and the answer came back like, those are great. He likes questions. Great. Okay. So, that, you know, so then it, th this is like, you know, early October and the interview didn't happen until I think the second Monday in December. And I had actually given up. I was holding because Simon & Schuster wanted it to happen before Christmas for obvious reasons, you know, for, to sell books. The journal was ho kept holding space and then giving it, you know, like, okay, well, it's not gonna happen. And so the last opportunity was the Christmas Eve edition. <laughs> this is so crazy. And, uh, you know, and so I got a call that it's either going to happen really late tonight, New York time, which is in he was then in California, which would be not so late for him hmm. or around lunchtime tomorrow. Now, I just assumed that meant lunchtime tomorrow because or not at all because it had been this dance going on for quite some time. And then, you know, within, it's the craziest thing, but like within an hour it was over, you know, it's like, it just, and, and I know people love it and I've gotten amazing feedback on it. And I, I don't feel like I did anything but show up. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the questions were maybe, I tried to approach it from not just as a, you know, my job as a journalist, but, you know, I'm a fan and I know what I'd like to ask him, but what I can't and what I'd like to ask him that I think he might, you know, entertain. Uh, and I think I, you know, I pushed the envelope a little bit. I tried to make it funny. I asked the Dunkin' Donuts question, you know, it's like, which I thought was, you know, ridiculous. It was <laughs> like, you asked that kind of question last. That was the very last thing because it's like, you know, if he hangs up or, you know, if, if the interview ends unceremoniously, that's what you got. <laughs> anyway, it, it was, it was, you know, it was very quick. The interview, you know, the, the issue then became his office really wanted the journal to run everything, but the way, you know, that just doesn't happen even on the internet where you can run as much text as possible, you know, the Google search engines and so forth, they don't pick up past 1500 words or whatever it is so we had to cut it down from 5,000 words or so to 1500 so then the office and I struck on the idea of putting it up on his website the whole thing because a lot of people just want to read that and so the agreement was was struck with the journal to hold it for I think a day so that people could get it on the Wall Street Journal and, you know, be attracted to the journal. And it was a big deal. Obviously, it's a big deal for them. The, I, I have to say, there were a lot of people at the journal who it didn't matter to, but the guy who was then the editor in chief was a huge Dylan fan. 
and and made it his mission. This was like he was I think he was leaving at the end of that year, like on the 31st. And he was like, we're getting Bob Dylan, you know, before I leave, we're getting Bob Dylan. So really thanks to him for, for you know, putting the screws to his staff to make it happen because, you know, it, he's not as important to, you know, like the, the, the pushback I got was, oh, we do Obama and George Clooney and we understand A-listers. And I'm like, <laughs> it, this, this is not, those, what are comes guys, before a? <laughs> yeah, those are guys who do a lot of interviews. Even if they don't do a lot of interviews, they know the game and they, you know, they, they do a lot of interviews relative to Bob. I'm like, this is not your normal A-lister. He's not going to do a photograph. He's not going to, you know, it's just like, we're going to be lucky if he does this at all, but I think he's going to do it because I was told at that point it was, it was going to happen. And it did. And, and so, you know, it's, it's funny. It, I only just said recently to a fellow Bob Dylan fan, um, because it came up, you know, people were talking about it again because of something in the news. I can't remember. And, um, and, you know, it's only now, like a year later that I can reflect on it and read it and have, cause I, I remember, you know, I got the transcript back and, and I was like, this is insane. You know, like this is the craziest thing that's ever happened to me, but <laughs> part of it, it's sort of an out of, out of body experience. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, that, that was, that was it. It was, um, it wasn't until recently that I was able to sort of read it as a fan and read it as somebody who, you know, parses Dylan's words for meaning and, you know, so forth. For, for a long time, it was just this <laughs> dream, <laughs> really strange experience. You know, you and I have talked for many, many years about, yeah. you know, like I, I'm sure we both said to each other, you know, like there's very few people who are at the top of the list. We both interviewed a lot of people. It's like how, you know, it, Bob wasn't, I mean, he was on the list, but it, it wasn't like, like McCartney seems much more attainable because like Obama or George Clooney or whoever, he's an A-list guy who does interviews. He's very selective, but he does do them. I mean, how many has Bob done essentially since Love and Theft, maybe six or seven? I think, and most of them, e either the AARP or for his website, which then gets sort of disseminated, you know? So it was, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I can say about it because it's, you know, it's par part of the agreement to doing that. You know, you have to juggle journalistic standards with the fact that he's Bob Dylan and respect right. that, you know, like I, I, I said, I think I said where, where I'm not even supposed to like say where he was or what, right, right, right. <laughs> the, you know, that it's like, it's very, you know, I, I was on Sirius just by coincidence a day or two after it doing my holiday gift guide. And they wanted to know live radio. Like they mm. wanted to know everything, right? Alan Light in particular, who's a friend of ours and, and a fellow, you know, Dylan Head and the whole thing. And and he he figured out pretty quickly that I couldn't really say anything and was yeah. respectful of that. I think right. that's you know so that's you know th that's the story. That's as much as a story I can tell. But that's a lot, you know. And I think anybody who who wanted to know the background, it's 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 a fun story. But I mean, I'll tell you from from the beginning of October when I when I got yes to that second week of December, it was like almost every day was like, is it going to happen today? I was ready. I had to be ready. <laughs> it's like Batman or something, you know, <laughs> like I had to be ready at all times for this to happen. And also and realizing it, it might not, you know? And and, just, you know. Yeah. But you know, it was funny. I was assured there was a, there was a point where it felt like it might fall apart because the journal was just like, we can't work like this. They do have journalistic standards. I mean, you know, it's like, and, and he doesn't care about that. You know, he doesn't care about what issue it goes in or, you know, deadlines or that's just not. In, and, he, and 
you know, to his credit, he was, th there was one night I remember where it was like, okay, well, he's, he's in Oxford. I remember this very specifically. He's in Oxford and he's going to get off the bus and go to his dressing room. And that's probably like, that's probably the window. So, you know, I'm like sitting by the phone. Like, did I miss the call? I should check my phone. Is it working? Is it charged? You know, <laughs> hope the power really doesn't insane. go out. <laughs> and, and then he had just decided to get on the bus and go to the next town heading for another joint, as they said. <laughs> and I was, you know, that's, you know, any other artist you probably wouldn't tolerate or give them that slack. But, uh, you know, I think, again, that, that editor in chief at the time at the journal really understood that this was a huge opportunity. You know, it, it can always be with an artist like Bob, it can always be the last interview they do, particularly when they do so few. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty, yeah. I mean, I can't believe we haven't talked since then. That's crazy, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's why, just to give you an open-ended question, tell me what you can tell and, you know, don't want to get anyone in yeah. trouble or... <laughs> but it was fun. It was funny to go back. It was funny to go back to Tulsa, having having previously been the guy who did the More Blood, More Tracks liner. And I said, okay, that's cool. Uh, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing not cool about that. Even as a fan, I understand that's cool. But it's a whole different thing to walk in a room and have people know, because we played... The, the we played in Duluth at their Dylan their yearly Dylan fest, and one of his friends said to me, "You know, you're the last guy to talk to Bob Dylan," and I'm like, "Well, I'm not," but because <laughs> this was like pretty soon after it happened, and, and I'm like, "Well, you know, I mean, he's obviously talked to more people than me since then, but it's crazy to think um, that's how, it, you know, it's it's." To be on the inside looking out is completely different. It's like, you know, I, I think I've said this before, but it's like, you know, somebody asked George Harrison, you know, so what is what's it like to be a Beatle? And he's like, I don't know. What's it like not to be a Beatle, right? So it's, it's like I don't mean to be smug about it, but it is that. It's like I, I can't even relate to it, it. Like, did that happen? You know, that's that's how <laughs> right. that's how. Yeah. And and to yeah, you know, I mean we we can go on and on about it all your interviews, but there's one other big recent one, and it ties also to your um uh blood on the tracks, uh, more blood, more tracks, um, liner notes where you talk about Pete Townsend and Pete Townsend um uh suggesting you go out and play his songs in the, yeah. the introduction, and then um, you had this this huge, I mean you know speaking of great albums, Who's Next was just uh, reissued as a um, Lifehouse uh, concept mega box set and you had another <clears throat> sorry you have, um and just um you know because i'm love pete townsend too just uh talk a little bit about uh your, your years and years of uh you know pete townsend really opens up to you and goes um, you, you know talks quite a bit in detail about the whole lifehouse thing in, in the interview so um uh what's what's your first of all how did well i know i guess just Again, what? Tell me about your what you want to share about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, your, sure. Uh, no, that's that's a story. I can tell the whole part. Uh, that, that's that's a fairly public story. That um, back in the early '90s, when Pete was living, you know, mostly living in New York, putting together the Tommy Broadway musical, which is coming back to Broadway in a next month, um, he. Uh, we ended up at a birthday party, a fashion, Tommy Hilfiger's birthday party. I, I don't know why he was there. I, I was there because my girlfriend at the time, it was very strange. But, you know, at the end of the evening, everybody went out drinking as, as you do in New York City. When the party's over, there's another party. And at the end of that night, um, Pete and I and his childhood friend, essentially, his roommate from the Who Days, um, Richard Barnes, who everybody knows as Barney, were sort of the last men standing. We got in a cab together, they dropped me off at home, and I was leaving. They, they, he had missed his flight, so he was leaving the next day. I was leaving the next day to do a tour of England just by myself, acoustic, whatever. And he said, oh, call me up when you're in town. And wrote his number on a piece of paper, as we used to do back in the day. 
and Barney did too. And I got out of the cabin. I'm like, again, like did that <laughs> happen. So I didn't call Pete because it just seemed too bonkers. And I did call Barney and he was like, oh, you should call Pete and you know, whatever. But because Tommy was in production, he started coming to town pretty regularly. He was living in the Royalton Hotel here. He was uh, dating my girlfriend's best friend. So, you know, as guys do, we would go out on these double dates with the girls. And, you know, like they would talk about whatever they would talk about. And we would be at the other end of the table talking about, we really didn't talk about music. We talked about books. He was very into Paul Auster at the time. So we were talk, talked a lot about, we both read his most recent book. We talked about that. I remember. And um, I never brought up music because I felt like, you know, I mean, he knew I was a musician. He knew what I did and he knew, but it, you know, as soon as you do that, it, it, you know, it, it changes the dynamic of the relationship because he's Pete Townsend and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I can't relate to him as a peer. Right. So we were just these two guys. So we ended up a couple of months later, you know, it was maybe six months into the relationship at a loft party. This guy had this photographer had, and we walked in, I remember we walked into the party and they had a stage set up with all this equipment. Now he had just come to the party to hang out and have a good time. But of course, you know, there's sort of a tacit understanding that if there's all this equipment, maybe Pete Townsend's going to jam with the band. You know, it's like, and I felt bad, but, you know, we hung out and it was fine. And, you know, at, at a certain point, a couple of the Tommy guys and I and some other musicians got up and we were playing, you know, we were just playing. And and he, um, in the middle of Sympathy for the Devil, I heard this ring guitar go off. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I know who that is. So we ended up jamming on, like, I don't remember playing any Who songs. Maybe we played Substitute and can't explain, but um you know we played like young americans and stuff like that it's just weird it was a weird you know like a drunken party and so th then it had crept into the conversation that i you know was a musician without really working too hard at it and there'd be events and i'd get up and jam with the band and i sang barefoot or won't get fooled again or whatever you know it's just like it, it just sort of evolved and at a certain point i asked him to produce some demos for me, which did change the relationship, not for the better for a minute. Um, and, you know, sort of, we shopped those to record labels. Neither of us were, were happy with the results. There's now, I think nine or 10 songs that we've discovered the master tapes for, which we're gonna release as like 30th anniversary release sometime, maybe later this year. Um, that I used his band and his brother Simon kind of oversaw it and Pete paid for it. It's very generous. Um, and then, you know, and then that was kind of, you know, he Did, went back uh, to first, England. First of all, that sounds exciting. But anyway, go ahead. I yeah, 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 yeah. I'm very excited. <laughs> I, I know I'm telling it like the Bob story. It's like, this is another thing that happened to me. This is insane. But you and I, I told you this story before, but this is, you know, this is for, for public consumption. So, and then, you know, so at that point, you know, we're, we're sort of connected and it's very strange, but I will say having been an absolute, you know, my, my bands growing up were like the clash and the jam and the small faces and the who, I mean, you know, obviously the Beatles were the Beatles and Dylan was Dylan, but those were my bands, you know, growing up, those sort of, and the kinks, you know, these kind of aggressive, edgy, you know, um, British, British R and B fueled, you know, bands. And so, but I remember saying to somebody, even back then, one of my best friends who, you know, I invited to a Who show or a Townsend show, I can't remember. And he hung out with the two of us and he was like, it was crazy to him that we were like arguing and, you know, going at each other. You know, it's like, he couldn't put together that this guy who he'd grown up seeing on television. And I said, you know, the guy who's like, in the Monterey pop film, smashing his guitar is not the guy I go to dinner with. It's, I have to disassociate those things. Good thing, anyway, it can be very expensive if you start smashing things at dinner. <laughs> well, it's very funny because I'm, we're, we're going back and forth, we were emailing back and forth the other day about he's selling some guitars and, and I'm, I wanna buy some. And he said, you know, I've realized if I smash them, they're worth more. <laughs> <laughs> so he does have a sense of humor about this. Anyway, so um, uh, anyway. So we just, 
you know, it's hard. He's in England. I'm here. I'd be over there. We'd see each other. Uh, he'd be over here. We'd see each other. But it is mostly a technology relationship, as all of us have nowadays. Um, but the cool thing is, since I've I've become a writer, you know, at, at a certain point in the 2000s when the record industry changed and my band at the time kind of, you know, imploded for various reasons, I had to look around for other things to make money. So I started writing about music and interviewing people. And he did not want to be interviewed by me. He, we talked about it. He was like, I just feel like I'm too, like, I won't, I will say things to you that I don't want to say, right? That makes sense. I had to respect that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, certainly I've done it long enough now and there's enough, he's seen enough of my work that I think he was comfortable doing it. So when the Who Sell Out box set came out a couple of years ago, I did a, I interviewed him and Barney because it was a really crucial time. It was the pivot point, I felt, in the Who's career. And, um, and we had a really great time. So when he did Lifehouse, you know, I think it was hard because it wasn't the actual anniversary. It was the scheduling of it was weird, you know, and I think for guys like him at a particular level, it's hard to be interviewed by just a journalist they don't know. They have no connection to it all because it's now via Zoom and it's, you know, there's all these um, so if somebody's going to come to that interview with bullet points or, you know, sort of a list of questions, I, I don't think he, you know, as anybody who knows him will know, he's not a super patient guy. So for that, you know, right. but I think he felt, I mean, he said, yes, I don't, I don't know why, but we did, we were supposed to do, you know, the normal like 20 or 30 minutes. We did over an hour. I felt bad for the PR guy who had to listen to us because a lot of it was like his wife was dipping in and so oh, I found these pictures of us from 1990. You know, it was like the crazy <laughs> poor PR guy. And we got to the end and, you know, I thought it was the end and I got plenty of information. But he he texted me uh, that night or the next day and said, you know, I felt like we didn't cover everything that you wanted to ask. And it was going really well. And do you want to do some more? So we did another. I mean, I think the total that I talked to him about Lifehouse and Who's Next was it was over three hours, you know, and it's for me as a fan, it's priceless. But I think, you know, he said at one point, and I think this is true. A lot of these guys will say this to journalists. It's like, you know more about this than I do. Like, you know, the pieces of the puzzle and you can put them together with some perspective, whereas I just lived it. And a lot of it's foggy, you know, but if you remind me and I can probably remind him better than other people, because I, it matters to me. It was a hugely important that that period of the who the sort of who's next to Quadrophenia is to me just the golden period as a band. They were at their best. They were working together in the best possible way. His writing and his demoing was just at its absolute peak. Um, so it's just a really interesting period to talk about. And I think, you know, if you're an artist and you sit down with somebody who knows and respects a, a particular period of your career like that, you want to, why wouldn't you want to talk about it? It's like, it makes you feel great, I'm sure. Um, and I think there were also things that came up in the conversation. He was like, he did say at one point, like, can you not put that? You know, I don't, I, I'd rather. And then he, and he's, of course, like Pete always does, he says some off the cuff things that he may or may not have said to another journalist, but the PR contact me later. It's like, mm, you know, can you not? And, you know, I'm, I'm respectful. I, I'm not a gotcha journalist. I don't care about you know, clickbait or any of that. I got plenty of great stuff from him. So I didn't really need it. So then it was like, okay, well now I, I had essentially two interviews plus a, 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 long, a lengthy email exchange. And I'm like, okay, well, this is really three interviews because we covered the same things, but from different points of view. So I was able to use it for, you know, one was really guitar oriented for a guitar magazine. And the other was, you know, for, uh, I guess, the Daily Beast, right? And then I had this third one and I'm like, okay, well, I may as well, I think I did the third one after the fact for Rock Seller. So they're, 
they're three very different conversations. The one about the guitar is really about his approach to the guitar, both over the course of his career and currently, which for, for guitarists is very interesting. But the Lifehouse stuff to me was just, you know, and how he figured out demoing and the use of synthesizers. And, you know, he was just such a pioneer at a time when people thought these things don't even make sound, pleasing sound, let alone music. He was able to, you know, ride herd over them in such a way that he was able to get these, you know, if, if you put five seconds at the beginning of Bob O'Reilly on in a Coliseum, every person's going to stand up and expect the who to come on. You know, it's like, that's, that's a trick. So, you know, I thought it was just an amazing opportunity to talk to him about. And, and, you know, he's, like I said, Tommy is coming back to Broadway. He'll be in town next month. We're going to have a little reunion of that 90s crowd. And I'm really looking forward to it. It's, you know, it's a really, it's an amazing relationship for, um, you know, I was talking about the record in an interview earlier today. And it's like, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm just this fan from Connecticut who happened to have this interesting life for whatever reason. I don't know how exactly that happened or why. I guess the why is more more like it. But um, I, I, you know, I'm not, I think I, I've, I've been around Pete enough to know most people are intimidated by him. And I, I wasn't, you know, and I think that's probably counts for a lot. That's the best I can do. If you meet Pete Townsend, don't be intimidated. <laughs> I have been, I will say this, there was a page six about us because we did get into a fist fight at Odeon. So that's how not intimidated I am. Back in, <laughs> a fr a fr and I don't, I didn't remember it. And somebody brought it up and I was like, that's crazy talk. And I had to ask this buddy of mine who was with us that night. He was like, oh no, that happened. You know, it's the craziest thing. So, you know, the, the, it was a, it was a wilder, wilder time. <laughs> you're almost like a member of the who if you get into a fist fight i mean you know oh i can tell you start see there was there was a there was a period in our relationship where his his the people around him were likening my influence to keith moon and let me tell you that may sound like fun but in <laughs> retrospect you know that that was a crash and burn scenario and i was lucky to get out alive and and i feel badly for you know particularly his his um assistant nicola who i'm very we were just emailing this morning and and um you know she's a sweetheart and i i used to have to send her flowers all the time because i would you know i was not a good influence and 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 uh you know and, and also you seem I so was, nice and calm in, in real life <laughs> yeah but i was you know I'm, I'm i'm an old man now i was i was 20 25, 26, 27 oh, good while with, you know, and a musician. And I had a little bit of success under my belt and a little bit of money and, you know, a little you bit of alcohol, like you, a little bit of Pete Townsend. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just feel like you can rule the world. So yeah, it was not a good combination, but you know, years and sobriety will, will years and sobriety will, you know, temper even the wildest beast i guess and unfortunately mooney didn't get there and that's a terrible thing because i yeah. would have liked to have seen you know i mean yeah. he was completely insane but i mean i think a, a 60 or 70 or 80 year old keith moon would be enormously entertaining or peter sellers for that matter you know so um so uh let's talk a little bit about um uh, tulsa and dylan and um sure. the bob dylan center um uh you know you have your own bands i saw you down at uh low down uh oh. and uh with uh uh leo gillis that joined you on stage uh who is the brother That's of right. jack white and um it was a you know uh, <laughs> i remember they uh just getting there was tough because the the reception was bad and i was trying to get you know i found some guy named uh ari sussman who said it's down there oh, and yeah. found it and we, we caught most of the set it was a great set um, a lot of fun <laughs> doing all those uh, Dylan covers. Um, uh, so uh, I guess I guess for, let's talk a little bit about you because you have your own music and then you're in tribute bands and you're in you know Wilburys and Tom Petty and you know that was Dylan that night. So um, uh, I guess if you can just I mean that's quite a bit, but they're all over the place. But uh, 
uh, you're you're that's a lot of songs <laughs> yeah well i never i mean i never played i never played any cover songs you know i've been doing music since uh professionally since about 84 and i, I was always adamant to do exclusively original material and i was always told by agents managers you know whoever if you you know if you pepper in some covers um, and, you know, I was always willing to do a cover, but I would also do the most difficult. I do like a Thunderclap Newman cover or or I we used to do. What was the one we. Oh, so if you want to do a, a. Why don't you do a who cover? Because you got the peak connection. And I would, of course, do like circles. Right. It's like <laughs> nobody knows that, you know, it's, right. like, it's like you got to be kind of a who fan to appreciate right. that. Anyway. Um, so. Um, so when I got back into doing this after my, my band, the badge kind of splintered and I got into writing and I was making my first solo record when I was starting to work on the booking thing, it became really obvious to me that if you were willing to do a, a good helping of covers and you could play anywhere and you know, it's, it, it is about, it is a business, you know, so it's about making a living. And so I was like, okay, well, I, there are, there are a lot of songs I won't play, you know, they just don't mean anything to me, but I don't mind playing Bob's songs. I don't mind playing Tom Petty's songs. You know, I love those songs and it's not work. I don't have to learn them. They're just there, you know, they're just kind of like in my DNA. So we started, um, you know, pretty early on, just sort of peppering in songs, Lennon songs, and then because I was playing with some of the guys from the Elephants Memory Band, and then and uh, and a couple of guys from Wings and Denny Lane, so I did some of that stuff, and you know, the reaction is very positive, and you can fill clubs and whatever, and also promote your own, you know, your own thing. Well, at a certain point, it, you know, we were doing that. We had a monthly residency here in New York City. And it's hard to do monthly shows. And so there's a, you know, it's a burnout even for the audience. So I thought, okay, well, maybe the way to do this is to do less of them and to do birthday shows. So if it's October, we'll do a petty birthday show. It doesn't have to be all petty. It can be songs he loved, artists he loved, or um, sing things that inspired him and songs of mine that sound like Tom, you know? And so that was the approach. So I think even that lowdown show I, I'm sure we did. I know, in fact, that we did a couple of mine um, that sort of fit in the Bob style. When we did, we played Canes at the Switchyard Festival this past year. And it was like, you know, I don't know, 50 50 or something, you know? So, um, and we didn't do, I mean, we did Bob because, well, I remember actually because I, I talked to the, organizers and they were like they had hired all these bands and nobody wanted to play any bob dylan and i'm like i'm happy to play bob dylan i'll play as much dylan as you want what do you want mm -hmm. and then i i uh bill bill pagel gave me some lyrics to rainy day women that bob had never sung so i'm like yeah sure i'll do those whatever you want <laughs> you know it's like i this is not work for me this is you know right. they call it you're you're being paid to play not to work yeah, so right. anyway um so it was a natural progression where, you know, you, you want to fill wherever you're playing. And sometimes, um, you know, if you just go out on your own steam, I mean, I'm not, and you're playing in Gainesville or you're playing in Tulsa or you're playing in, um, you know, Woodbridge, New Jersey or Mesquamic at Rhode Island, my name you know, it's not going to bring a huge crowd, but if you add to it that we're going to do these artists that I love, you know, there's, there's plenty of fans of all those guys and the weekend Wilburys, which is what we call it, which is a catch all. You can do ELO, you can do Roy Orbison, you can do, um, you know, Tom and Bob and George. And it's like, well, everybody loves all those guys, you know, even if they're not a Wilburys fan per se, if you say, you know, the, the music of George Harrison, Bob, people love that and it's a very family friendly thing and 
So look, I, I, I went from being the guy who like, I would not, I just, I remember, I feel bad for the agents and managers I used to fight with in the eighties and nineties. Like, I, no, I'm, I don't want to do that. If you do this, you can play instead of playing a two or 300 cap, you can play a thousand cap. And cause that was back when you could capacity, sorry, folks, that, that you could, you know, that, things were different you could play a thousand seats now the business is different um you know I, I so but when you're young you're stupid and you're unbending and i think that was um you know now i feel very very fortunate to uh to be able to be paid to strap on a guitar and play music and so if if the the hard part of that is I have to play a couple of Dylan songs or Petty songs to make people happy, I, I'm no less happy than they are. You know, I love those songs too. I try and pick the ones that are maybe a little off center or maybe the arrangements are our own or, you know, we try, like if we do things like Tulsa or whatever, we try and throw in, you know, verses that maybe don't get sung or, you know, it's a little, because we did for a minute in, in New York, a show called Dylan Obscuro, which was like songs he either never did or never recorded or doesn't play live anymore. Or, and there's a million, I mean, there's a million, you know, like that's how we struck on playing baby, don't you, uh, baby, let me follow you down. That's a great song. And he, uh, when's the last time he played that? Like nine, you know, 97, 98. I'm mean, somebody out there is going to look it up, but, <laughs> um, but a really long time. Right. And um, and he certainly doesn't do that, the, the hopped up band version from 66. And that's my favorite version. So we do that, you know, all the time. You know, we're going to do a run of shows in May. And a lot of them, because it's his birthday, will be Dylan themed. We'll probably play that every night. Ain't going nowhere. Baby, let me fall you down, you know. But the Dylan Obscura show, we would do like, I don't want to do it. Or we do, you know, Quinn the Eskimo. Or we do, you know, like. Songs that they're obvious to you and me. They're not obscure to you and me, but they're obscure to the general public, but they also know them. You know, once you play Quinn the Eskimo, every, the whole audience knows it. But when's the last time he played that? Certainly 20 years, you know, so obs obscura. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, um, and uh, I don't know if there's something you can uh, explain, but so there's the Bob Dylan Center and then there's Switchyard. And do they have anything to do with each other anymore? Are they totally separate entities? Do you know how anything about I don't them? really know. I believe I believe Switchyard is under the auspices of the university. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong about this. You might want to get somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. No, I, I think you're right. But um, but of course, because the Dylan Center is in Tulsa and the the Dylan Center and the Woody Guthrie Center are, you know, a huge attraction for the city of Tulsa, and the the Kaiser Foundation, Kaiser Family Foundation, is is trying to turn Tulsa into, you know, a real destination for people and a, and a beautiful place for people to live and visit. Um, I, I think it's the rising tide lifts all boats scenario, but I I don't. My understanding is that they are separate, but I think do their best to coordinate because why wouldn't they, right? Yeah. And they're all great people. I mean, you know, like the universe, the people I dealt with, and I'm sure you too at the university are just amazing as yeah. are, you know, Larry Jenkins and Mark and, you know, all the people at the, at the Dillon Center, they're fantastic. They're just fantastic people. Yeah, I've had, I've, I've had great, great, uh interactions with all of them absolutely yeah. all of them yeah um and so uh uh, uh the first time I, I guess as i'm getting older i, I hope i might be screwing it up a little so in 2019 you, you did a, a roger mcguinn interview and then was it this year you did margo this year was margo price i mean this last year this last yeah. one was margo price yeah. which is great you did a little uh i did you do a great interview but then you did a um a little set accompanying her on a few songs yeah that was not you know that just came up I had forgotten about that. It came up in, in my YouTube feed and I was like, wow, that was cool. Um, yeah. In between 
they had been on Zoom. So I did Rodney Crowell and Eric Anderson and Steve Earle for the for the Dylan conferences that were held during the pandemic. So those did happen. The McGuinn one was obviously like in the ballroom with, you know, the, the full on thing. And we, you know, that was just the thrill of a lifetime. I love I love Roger. Um, so this year, uh, I suggested Margo because I'm a really big fan of hers. I know her and her husband, Jeremy, you know, pretty, pretty well. And I thought she would be able to speak about Bob to a broader audience. She also, you know, she had a book to promote and a new record to promote and she's a friend. So I'm like, okay, well, let me suggest this friend of mine because it, it's good for everybody. And I just thought she was amazing. I mean, I thought she, <clears throat> she's such a huge fan. And it was funny because we spent the day, we were going to do like a pre-interview, spent the day in her hotel room. I mean, not, we were supposed to be talking about her and Bob and we ended up just playing songs. So that was how that happened. We, I don't think either of us was really thinking we were going to perform, but she had a guitar and I had a guitar. So she was like, well, do you know, meet me in the morning, which is just a blues. Mm. And of course, more blood, more track. So yes. And then we did. <laughs> oh, sister, oh, sister. Yeah. Which she wanted me to sing with her. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, this is your, you yeah. know, but it's like McGuinn. If McGuinn asked me to sing, I'm like, he turned to me at one point during the sound check. was like, Jeff, do you know the harmony? I'm like, yeah, yes, Roger. I <laughs> do know the harmony. You know, it's like, it's ridiculous. Um, so I was happy to do that. And I can't remember the third song we did, but you yeah. know, she's it was one of her amazing. songs. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, she's, she's just an amazing talent. She's definitely sort of one of those up and coming people that, you know, people in our world certainly should keep an eye on. She's the real deal. You know, she's not a, you know, a, a country pop star. She's like an old school country person who loves, you know, now everybody calls it Americana, but that's, it's really that Willie Christofferson, you know, that sort Outlaw of kind of thing. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I never thought, I mean, I just thought that was country music, yeah. you know, to me. The, the, way, it's came, the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, was Merle out? I mean, yeah, Merle was an outlaw, but that, you know, it's, it's like when you, <laughs> Hank he Williams, was in jail. <laughs> yeah. It was Hank Williams outlaw country. I mean, he was just, no, but he yeah. is, I mean, if you had to put him in a category now, you would put him in, he'd be played on serious outlaw country, which is just insane to me. But, but country music is not, you know, not what we grew up with. Yeah. And, and, and I think, um, you know, that's fine. You know, the record labels need to make their money and the publishing people need to make their money. And Nashville has become a certain thing. And, and like, pop music you know everything comes in cycles and we're at the we're back at the sort of pre-beatles how much is that doggy in the window era of mm. music again yeah and once the streaming world shakes out a little bit hopefully we'll get another revolution and i i'm not saying that's gonna be rock and roll i don't think it will be and it probably won't be hip-hop hip-hop either it'll be something that we can't imagine yet which great i'm all for it so and just, you know, now did I get the book there uh, and then had her sign it. But then I, when I got home, I got the audio book, the Margo Price. It's, it is that book I would recommend to anybody. And the whole, it's, I don't even want to hint on uh, what you're going to go through, but she's had some life. Yeah. She's, she's amazing. And, um, and I, and I think too, she's a, she's a real music fan. I mean, she, the reason we, her, her daughter's name is Ramona. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Talking I'm about being aware. a fan. <laughs> she she's she's one of those people who's the real deal I, I don't throw that around lightly and i'm not just that's not just her branding i mean she you know i, I was talking about her recently with a, a friend in the business and you know i was trying to explain that her she's as much a fan of ray davies and which you got from the book you know that right. their songwriting style comes as much from the kinks Mm -hmm. as it does from Willie Nelson or Chris Christopherson. You know, it's like they're, they're trying to write classic songs in the classic style, you know, real stories with real people and, and that, you know, really touch you in a meaningful way. And that's, 
not what's on the airwaves these days, but I think that's why she she's it's a slower grind than say maybe and no disrespect to Brandy Carlisle, who I also love, but she's not, you know, popping out the way Brandy Carlisle is because Brandy's a she's she has that pop element to her, whereas Margot is, you know, a, a slower burn. But I think they'll both end up huge stars in the end. So. Um. All right. So, uh, all right. So, so now that we've talked about um, you and all the things you do, we're going to talk about the, the album that's coming out. It's called the last day of summer. Um, I've only heard the one, the one sing, the one single. That I don't know why produced. we didn't send you the whole thing. I apologize. I was that's it okay. Um, but uh, um, based on the uh, info sheet that came with it, it's there. The main album is 10 songs and there are four bonus tracks. Um uh the opening song is heartbreak which you performed last time uh when we did an interview and i will um link to that in the uh oh cool notes that go with this um okay. uh nine originals plus a, a cover one cover of a, a friend of pete townsend's uh ronnie lane uh the the poster. poster yep and um so uh uh and the uh the single i guess it's a single right is the um a broken parentheses broken without you and um so alphabetically i don't know where else show up in your in your lists but um so uh uh so why don't we just uh, talk about how i mean it's a long time coming this this record so i want to talk about the um how it came about yeah well you know heartbreak and the poacher are already out you know yeah. they sort of came out during the pandemic um well so like everybody else in the spring of 2020, I just finished a run of shows. I've been out in LA and then I did the show here at town hall, the, this land is your land show where a bunch of us got COVID and, you know, I was upset to, Wait, you, you uh, got, you got it early on, like before the vaccine. Yeah. Um, maybe we shouldn't talk about that, but you're still here. So that's good. But <laughs> it was scary though. You know, it was, yeah. it was a scary time particularly here in New York city. And I'm, I'm across from the hospital. So that's all it was. Yeah. It was unpleasant. Um, I had a great doctor and I'm, you know, relatively healthy. So that helps. Um, anyway, so, you know, the plan had been that Earl Slick and I were going to go in and make a record and in the fall go out on the road. And we had been asked weirdly to support a, a pretty big classic rock band and I don't know if that would have happened or not, but we were also going to do, it was going to be the uh, anniversary of Double Fantasy. So we we're going to do some shows around that. And it's a lot in the works. So we figured, okay, we'll, we'll make a record. So when the pandemic hit, um, I had set aside time to make that record and also to finish up the writing. And I thought, well, I'm just going to keep writing. So I did that. And pretty quickly i had a batch of songs that i really liked heartbreak being one of them so just to sort of see if it could work long distance i sent the tracks um to uh paul weller's drummer who was in england and then to slick was in massachusetts and then duff mckagan was in uh well seattle actually not la uh, he played bass and then Lee Harris from Nick Mason's Sauce Full of Secrets was in France. Um, Jordan Summers did keyboards out in LA and we sort of jigsaw puzzle, you know, to put this all together. And we obviously over tracked, we recorded way too much stuff. And then I had this guy, Dwayne Lundy, who's worked with, you know, Willie and Ringo and all these great people to do the mixing. And he's able to make sense of it and make it sound like a band. And I thought, okay, well, that's a way forward. And, you know, by this time, this is now the last time we talked, this is, you know, fall of 2020. There was no, you know, there was no obvious horizon at that point. So I thought, okay, well, I had maybe half a dozen songs at that point. So I kept writing. And by the spring, I had enough for a record or that, you know, I had maybe 20, but 10 or 12 that really sort of went together um and there was a vaccine so slick and i went up to a studio in connecticut this guy eric lichter who's the producer of the project and hunkered down and cut the basic tracks for the 
whole record. And then again, started sending them around to all these people. And so, you know, it was amazing. Nobody said no, you know, it was the only person who said no was Peter Frampton. And it was because at the time I asked him, you know, the, the way his IBM disease works, there are, there are good times and bad times mm -hmm. where he just, you know, and he was in one of the bad times and he hadn't really started playing again. He's now doing quite well. And he was like, well, you know, I just, and it was actually this song. It was actually Broken Without You. And he just, you know, it was fine. I was like, you know, no pressure, you know, but he, so, um, you know, Ron Blair from the Heartbreakers is on it. Jeremy Stacy from Noel Gallagher's band, a bunch of the guys from Paul Weller's band, Jessica Greenfield from Weller's, uh, from Noel Gallagher's band. Um, I'm trying to think who else, you know, there's Jody Bagley, who's in the, the band tribute uh, uh, band that's, you know, sort of playing everywhere. I think they're called Chess Fever, maybe. I think that's what it is. But, um, you know, all these guys who are just my friends and obviously Slick and, you know, whoever else. Um, and so, again, I, you know, sent it all out to Dwayne and he made sense of it. And so the record was pretty done. This is now like a year and a half ago. And um, I just, you know, the label's feeling was because that was the first, like everybody was getting out on the road and everybody was putting out records because everybody made a record during the pandemic. And they were like, look, if you put it out now, we'll do that, but it's going to get squashed because there's no way you can compete with not just the Foo Fighters of the world, but every other independent artist out there is just like flooding the market with merch. So maybe let's wait till the fall. So we waited and then it was still kind of going, going, going. And he, so they targeted May. I guess it was February, but then it was May and came up with the idea of doing these teasers. And in the meantime, the, the song that you're talking about, Broken Without You, um, I was on the phone with Dave Stewart. I had interviewed him and we got along and we'd struck up a friendship. And uh, I don't remember why we were talking. I think he was maybe coming through New York or whatever it was. And he's like, what are you, you know, what are you working on as, you know? And so I told him and I was complaining that I just couldn't crack the song was almost there. And I was thinking I might drop it from the record. And he was like, oh, send it to me. Cause he's, he has a studio on this little tiny island in the Atlantic, right? And he's like, oh, send it to me and I'll see what I can do with it. Now, this is a guy who's made a few hit records in his life. I'm like, <laughs> sure, why not? And you know, it's funny, part of it was just when he sent it back, part of it I'm sure was that somebody else had crack the code a little bit but part of it and and i'm sure part of it was that it was dave stewart you know but it came back and the the guy who runs my label was just so excited and you know that's pretty flattering as well as dave stewart not sending it back and saying oh i can't do anything or this is terrible or you know, whatever so you know is is and it really did just a few little changes in the mix and a few little guitar things here and there that he added you know really elevated it in a in a very unique way that i you know it if i played you both versions you might not hear the difference but one makes you sit up and tap your feet and the other is kind of like oh that's a cool song you know so it's the, and that's you know that's the whole game right there <clears throat> excuse me um and uh so you have and is there any reason why you have it as a quote-unquote bonus track as opposed well the original version is on the album so mm -hmm. um so it it is the single version instead of the album version so there are two different versions of the song so people can hear what i what we originally did and they can hear what dave did and they'll can choose for themselves which they like better and you can tell me about the uh, uh, the person who helped you with the singing on that track. Well, so I needed I needed a uh, an extra. Well, I had this break and I had the idea that it should have a French section. So I asked a friend of mine um, to add a part and uh, and she did. And it's great. 
you know, it's, 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 uh, um, how do you pronounce her name? How do you pronounce her name? Oh, her, her name is YC. YC. So she, she was in Noel Gallagher's band for a while after his last album, not the most recent Council Skies, mm -hmm. uh, the previous one that Dave Holmes produced. And, um, yeah, I think we met at a show here after a show here in New York. And I knew, I knew Jeremy Noel's drummer and his brother who works on all of, runs Noel's studio and works on all his records. And Jess Greenfield, who also did vocals on, on a couple of the tracks, who's in his current band. So it was just, you know, I was just, I was just asking everybody and anybody. And, and Todd Morse, who's the bass player in The Offspring, who, um, I mean, he's great. You know, he's just, and he, you wouldn't think a guy from the offspring would want to have anything to do with this, but, you know, he does the call and response vocal and that's really cool. Um, and, uh, and, and I was looking up uh, schnitzel records. I didn't really, they have, a, they have, they have, that's, it's on schnitzel records, right? It and is. They have a uh, Brendan that is Benson, a real thing. Earl Slick, uh, Vapors of Morphine, the Dean Ween band. Um, um so uh how so what so what formats are these is is this a, a download um, no, no no i mean there's there's a beautiful cd so like you said bob grun shot the cover oh, that's and the right. way yeah. Yeah. the way um the cd actually is like a picture frame with a with a die cut and a little cello clear cello window mm -hmm. and so you can pull out the photo and it's an actual bob grun print that comes with each uh, CD. So now the debate is, you know, everybody wants vinyl. And the, the tricky part with the vinyl is, first of all, to do that and gatefold and all the other stuff is very expensive. But that's not the hardest part. The hardest part is if you're an independent artist and you press vinyl, I, you know, nine times, you got to charge people 25 bucks for it. Nine times out of 10, it sounds terrible. That's just a reality. You're not the Beatles or the Who or whoever it is. You're not at the top of the queue. So the quality control is 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 pretty poor. And this is what you know my label was saying that you know we're going to see the response to this single, and it's been very good so far. And then sort of make a decision about what to do about vinyl if the market can sustain it, and even if it comes out a little later. I'd certainly have it for, you know, I mean, we'll be promoting this record for a good year. Um, but I, you know, his, his point to me, and I thought I hadn't ever thought of this was, you know, we can do vinyl, but would you, you know, how would you feel if it was vinyl that in five years from now you put it on and thought that sounds terrible, you know, cause we're all snobs about vinyl. Now we want it to be really high quality, high gram, analog cut, you know, all these things. And the master, the vinyl master is beautiful. But um, if the pressing process is mediocre at best, you know, cause we're not, you know, what are we doing 500 or a thousand or, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, the quality control is just not there. So we have to make a decision how, you know, can we do enough that it's gonna sustain quality control where we can do two or three test pressings and get it exactly right and do a high gram pressing and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, you know, like it, it's, it's, it's a bummer to be a, uh, to be a vinyl snob because I would just be like, just do them just like, you know, right. but he's, he's absolutely right that if you get it home and you play it and it doesn't sound good, you'll never play it again. You know, you, you don't want to put that on your expensive turntable with your expensive cartridge. You want something that you feel is worth playing. So, yeah. So, no. To be and determined. To be determined. Um, and so, uh, so what's next for Jeff Slate? Well, that's it. I mean, you know, we have, um, there's another single coming out next month which features pretty much the same cast of characters. Um, Steve Craddock from Weller's band, not on guitar. He's Weller's guitar player, but he plays piano on the track actually. Um, and, and it's not, you know, it's a, it's a very different sound for me and for, 
um, you know, anybody who's familiar with my past records. So that'll be out at some point. I can't remember the date, uh, middle of March. I don't know if there's one in April or not. I can't remember, but I know May 17th is the album. And, you know, May, May and October are set aside for playing every possible gig we can play. And then between those months, they'll, you know, months they'll be playing more but yeah those are the you know those are the big months that people are on the road and that you know we've got sort of planned out to be out there as much as possible so people won't be able to get rid of me <laughs> and um of course you're all over social media you're on uh is there anything you're not on i mean you are you on uh all the all the major uh Platforms. You know, my, my, my label, my label was encouraging me to get on TikTok. And I said to my daughter, well, can you teach me TikTok? <laughs> and she's like, why do you want to do this? And I, so I told her and she said, well, it's, it's too late. It's like, you're, first of all, you're not somebody who is well suited to TikTok. You don't want to be on it. She's like, trust me, you don't want to be on TikTok. <laughs> but, but also, you know, it's, it's, it's just another, I'm not, I mean, I'm not averse to social media because it's a great communication tool. And as Bob says, a lot of people found love there, but, um, <laughs> but, but it's, you know, it's also a cesspool and it's a time suck and it's all those other yeah. things, but it's, you know, look as, as a, as an, you know, B or C tier independent artist mm -hmm. in New York city, it's, it's really easy for me to get out my message to people all over the world who, you know, I was looking at the streaming numbers for Broken um, just this morning and they're all over the place. There's there's people in Ukraine and Japan and Singapore. And I'm like, you know, a guy like me could not reach those people if it weren't for social media and the streaming platforms. So as much as I, you know, dislike elements of it, I, I accept that this is the world we live in and there is an upside, particularly for somebody like me. I, I understand if you're an artist, if you're a legacy artist and you're locked in to an old deal where you're getting sort of a pittance royalty rate, but that's not my situation. I own my masters and I own my publishing. So the money essentially comes directly to me. It's not a lot, but it's, I, you know, I, I had this conversation before he died with Crosby because he was obviously no fan of Spotify. And he was incensed that like I would make more from one of my songs that was relatively popular than he would from Cut My Hair because, it, you know, there were so many people taking a piece of it yeah. of the streaming pie before he even got to it that, you know, it, he would get, you know, if I got whatever, he, he was getting a, a, a far less percentage yeah. than I was. And, he, you know, he would... He didn't hold back. And he, he was kind of opinionated that David Crosby. <laughs> yeah, I miss that dude though. I I have to say, <laughs> Dave I was like great. Talking. I like talking to him. Yeah. yeah, Dave was great. All right, so um, uh, thank you, Jeff. This has been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for uh, going, uh, sharing so much of this information that I know people uh, have already. If you get to the end of this, you know you've already, you've you've heard a lot, and you, and if you're a Who fan or a Dylan fan or and, and hope especially if you're a Jeff Complete fan. Uh, you get to, um, uh, you know, find out all, all the ins and outs. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, there'll be links in the, the blog that goes along with this. So you can um, uh, see what we're talking about. Anything that um, we reference will uh, have links to. And, um, man, you're the man, Jeff. That was awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks, Harold. Always fun. All right. All right well, take care. <laughs>